page number 273 continued munnu came back through the monsoon clouds that were gathering on the higher ridges of the simla hills as he was about a 100 yards away from the bungalow looking down on the heavenly pastures of annandale there were mutterings of thunder and the sky overhead was black and lurid as soon as he stepped onto the veranda of the bungalow the trailing clouds poured down their contents for hours the rain continued with intermittent peals of thunder which were echoed by the tall mountains and flashes of lightning that lit the list, uh, mist on the on the dense vegetation with an earth, unearthly splendor then a light breeze swept the clouds away towards the plains where the water of the flooded sutlej shone like a silver sea end of page number 273 now page number 274 the weather continued with intervals of a few hours for 3 days and during the dark days munnu brooded on the physical fatigue he was beginning to feel except when the mem sahib sent him with another urgent message to the tailor or the shoemaker one evening he went to the uh, to the bastis of the rickshaw men to seek consolation of uh, mohan these were a, co- a collection of wooden huts below the lower bazaar on the way to the cart road a dirty scum covered ditch ran by them apparently carrying the filth of the markets to the khad munnu could not discover in which particular hut mohan lived because several coolies crowded round hubble bubbles in each of them in the darkness only illuminated by the fuming cotton wicks of the earthen earthen saucer lamps he felt strangely awkward among the men because though mostly hill men from the simla hill states and kangra they were also also uh, diverse in one hut a crowd of coolies were singing hill songs to the tune of a dholki and he felt drawn towards it but on reaching it he found that it was choking with smoke from a hearth fire which a kuli was frying sweet pancakes thick clouds of uh, fumes hung over the heads of the kulis like long snakes and pythons suspended from the ceiling because there was no ventilator the gas got into munnu's lungs as lured by the music he stayed for a while and it was only when it stung his windpipe sharply that he walked out coughing and clutching his throat throat at last he found mohan seated to a meal in a porch in the veranda of a hut away from the 12 other men who ate sat or lay asleep on the floor welcome welcome cried two of them who knew him mohan silently brought munnu a jute rag to sit on the old timers looked at looked at him munnu felt that they were criticizing him for being very green why is everyone having sweet pancakes today he asked mohan have you forgotten all your festivals just because you are a mem's servant said a kuli before mohan could answer we are celebrating the rains don't you take any notice of them said mohan don't you take any notice of them said mohan they have come here season after season and they don't know any of their festivals either and yet they preen themselves on their experience end of page number 274 now page number 275 but they are fools they rush up here long before the rain start just because they want to be in time to get the rickshaws which are good to look at they are illiterate and uncouth and they have become sterile driving rickshaw rickshaws up hill and down dale till now there is nothing left for them but to mock at others all right learned one you need not lose your temper at a joke said the kuli who had spoken and will you knock me up before sunrise tomorrow as i have to go to sanjawli good said mohan and proceeded to light a beedi and don't forget about that loan from me from the choudhury for my marriage for me from the choudhury from my marriage the kuli looked said cockily that i will forget said mohan you will become a slave to the pockmarked fat usurer and what is the use of your marrying if after marriage you want to come here year by year your heart is weak now and you might fall dead any moment as 
and as you said put in another kuli he has no guts left so what does he want a wife for the company laughed what shall i do then the man continued go back to your land man said mohan that is my advice to you go and work on your land my land is mortgaged already said the kuli then come with me and we shall kill the landlord one day and get you your land said mohan it is my object to make you people realize that if you work you should have a share in the things that you produce with the sweat of your brow oh you can keep your wild notions for those uh, for those others said the kuli i want to live here work smoke and uh, smoke the hookah play cards now and then and never be too tired to pick up another fare if it if it comes my way yes you fool burst uh, burst out mohan you will let them kill you you are all ignorant slaves how can i drill any sense into your heads all right then we will begin our lessons tomorrow said the kuli jocularly and wrapping himself in his blanket from head to foot he affected a sleep affected sleep i will come back in a moment said mohan to munnu and disappeared into the road munnu suddenly felt disconcerted disconnected from the world of this hut it was as if light had suddenly been extinguished such was the silent end of page number 275 now page number 276 sympathy that flowed from mohan to him the kuli who had turned in the in to sleep cheekily lifted his head and said tell me ustad ustad mohan but on looking round he saw that mohan was not there oh he has gone then he said he is a very strange fellow i can't make him out if he has been to vilayat and is such a learned man why does he drive rickshaws and live among us he comes from a high class family said an old kuli coughing over his hookah he had an easy life in his childhood and youth and now he is doing a sort of penance for his sins he felt very alone he told me isolated and could not mix with people and he wants to learn to be a man among men daily munnu said how extraordinary mysterious said the kuli who was lying down he is said the old kuli but he would be in prison if he were not the sarkar has spies about to catch anyone who goes about doing the work he does hasn't he talked to you yet about it no whispered the other kuli rather surprised and afraid well we will talk to you uh, he uh, he'll talk to you one day at this mohan came back with a little packet in his hand here oye munnu he said here is some fruit for you to eat we can't entertain you on anything very much in this place there is nothing worth while in the shops either streets are poisonous you must eat plenty of fruit and drink half a seer of milk every day you are looking very thin and now you must go the rain has just stopped go to bed early munnu said jai deva to all the coolies and hurried away afraid of mohan and grateful he had been absorbed in the talk of the two coolies his mind had gone back from the sinister atmosphere which the old coolies information had built up built up to the evening and uh, the evening in the chawl at bombay after ratan had been discharged and the three sahibs had come to talk to the coolies was mohan one of those sahibs he wondered and he walked home wrapped in the glow of warmth that he had felt in mohan's company on friday the, the day of the dance he caught the contagion of his mistress's enthusiasm and virtually floated through the sunshine that had succeeded the monsoon smelling the damp deodars in the thin air and listening to the sounds of waterfall on the slopes of the mountains and when at length his mistress uh, walked out after a protracted toilet to take her seat in the rickshaw to meet major end of page 276 now page 277 merchant for, for dinner at the hotel cecil before going for the dance he felt very happy and proud especially as her naive uh, enthusiasm she had asked him whether she looked beautiful and had pinched his cheeks, cheeks and giggled when he said yes when i am wonderful he exerted himself with renewed vigor to push the rickshaw and waited 
impatiently with the other coolies during the dinner, drying his clothes, which were wet with perspiration and stuck to his body. The run from the Hotel Cecil to the Viceroy's residence was not long enough, he felt. So eager was he to enjoy the glow of the Bim Sahib's company as he ran past the twinkling lights on the hillside, and he worked himself up to an extraordinary high pitch of excitement as he sat with the hundreds of other coolies watching the fair and fortunate of Shimla come in their rickshaws and walk into the walk into the long throne rooms whose portals stood open, reflecting the dazzle of huge chandeliers on the on to the lawns of the vice regal lodge. The Mem Sahibs all wore thin silken dresses which uh, almost swept the earth at their heels and furs and wraps which scarcely hid their necks and shoulders either against the cold or the rude stares of the rickshaw coolies. The, the Sahibs seemed to Munnu, on the other hand, overdressed to, to their black long coats and wax collars and shirts and long rows of medals long rows of medals and some of them were dressed in curious clothes which he did not know how they put on. So fast did their silken knee breeches uh, seem to stick, uh, so, um, so fast did the <coughs> silken knee breeches stick, uh, seem to stick to their legs and so high and stiff were the collars of their short gold embroidered jackets. Occasionally Indian Maharajas were driven up in all the on uh, in all the resplendence of their bejeweled ceremonial robes, and Munnu envied their small sons who were going into the dance hall with them, dressed up in the most perfect achkins and white tight trousers. The arrival of a few padres created some amusement among the coolies, as they had never imagined that these long robed pri uh, priests with huge beards would want to go to the dance. The band struck up, God save the king, while the guests were yet entering. Grand shows these dancers, said a coolie. Yes, said another. It costs them a lot of money. It cost my sahib 2,000 rupees to buy his scarlet cape and velvet sable and satin breeches. My main sahib had paid 300 rupees for her frock, said Munnu eagerly and with pride. End of page number 277. Now page number 278. And all the trouble of procuring a, tip, a ticket. I added Mohan sardonically. You don't seem to like this show, said the first Kohli. I should think not. From what I have seen of them, replied Mohan. It is strange how these people can think that it is amusing to spend all the money they do to, to come and meet people they really do not want to meet for they have a caste system more rigid than ours. Any Angrezi woman whose husband earns 12,000 rupees a month will not, uh, will not uh, leave cards at the house of a woman whose husband, husband earns 500. And the woman whose hun, uh, husband earns 500 looks down upon the woman whose husband earns 300. There is no love in the rich. They don't really want to mix with each other this is a ceremonial, obser ceremonial observed to show the pomp and the glory of the Sarkar by the Tunda, Tunda Lat, Lymph Lord, who governs us. The women uh, perspire in their tight frocks and their underclothes get wet, and the men are uncomfortable in their trousers as they flirt with other people's wives. And then they say how smart it was all as they drink tea at Davis goes while you, you starve. How can you say all this? asked the first coolie. What do you know of the Sahib Lok's life? How can I say all this? answered Mohan. What do I know of the Sahib Lok's life? I knew a bearer to the wife of a colonel of the army headquarters who lived on Jakku Hill. Jakku Hill. She was a fair, she was a fair haired, pretty little woman of about twenty five while the colonel was, had turned 55. She had married him for his position and money, it seemed, because Gulam, his servant, saw several times that when the colonel touched her, she shrank back from him. He was a solid middle-aged man with a huge formless face 
kind enough but somehow repulsive to her well she was unhappy with him and she had she would begin to drink wine as soon as he went to the office in the morning and then she, uh, then she would come and watch gulam at work in the drawing room just watch him and make him feel uncomfortable because she only had a dressing gown on over her naked body she would ask him embarrassing questions about whether he was married and how he liked women and what not he told her that he loved a girl in his village whose parents had prevented him from marrying her but that he hoped one day to go back and find her and live with her page end of page number 278 now page 279 One day she came into the gold camera very drunk and catching hold of Gulam suddenly said I'm better than that woman you loved in your village look I am a white woman and the wife of a colonel I loved a poet once and he loved me but I did not marry him because he had very little money now I'm sorry but I want you I don't care whether you are a colonel's wife or who you are Mim Sahib Gulam said I'm sorry for you but I don't love you and he threw her away He was afraid that she would trump up a false charge against him and have him imprisoned if he was not kind to her but he didn't care he ran from the place she followed him crying oh don't go away don't go away from me oh come back he felt sorry for her really sorry because he liked her and would have liked to have had her he hated the colonel for making the poor girl's life miserable but he ran away ran away since then gulam has never been bluffed by the pomp and show of these people to believe that they are happy and i have from my own experience of europe found that the rich only want thrills and pleasure it is strange they are dancing said the fr- uh, first coolie now impressed by mohan's story to question the, uh, to question the, his admiration for the sahibs and the rajas what is the meaning of pushing a woman about here and there so stiffly It is all kind of graceful love game said Mohan but it has now become mere play and the love is not thought of except that it warms up the old natures of the cold natures of these people and they can go kissing and tittering in the corners and prepare to get married or go to bed together you don't need to dance about to go to bed with women you roughs you are superior to all these colonels and generals and maharajas you still uh, but still you go on driving their rickshaws you do that too don't you a coolie said yes because i shouldn't get an opportunity to get to talk to people like you look they are walking about in couples in the garden said munno yes said mohan don't explore the garden too eagerly or you will see something you won't like it is nothing to me what she does said munnu naively i am only her servant end, uh, end of page number 279 now page number 280 and he looked across the valley to the light of the sal- uh, light of solan lights of solan twinkling in the clear sky then he sat listening to the strange zigzag music of the viceroy's royal uh, orchestra it jangled on his nerves a bit he was tired and yawned mohan spread his cotton wrap around him saying you look ill you ought to sleep no no munnu protested i am all right and then the saliva in his throat choked him and he coughed a harsh continuous cough which seemed to distress him till he spat out mouthfuls of blood you fool you fool cursed mohan i told you at masobra that you are ill surely this is not the first time you have spat blood munnu waved his head to signify no then why did you tell your ma'am that you could not draw the rickshaw have you told her that you are spitting blood munnu kept still mohan's voice of concern had roused the coolies who sat around from their repathi and around from their repathi and they crowded round the boy the sepoy who stood on guard at the gates of the vice regal uh, lodge thought he scented trouble he walked up exactly as if he, he were on his beat left right left right and without relaxing his pose asked in a stern, a stern voice who goes there a boy taken ill sarkar one of the coolies informed him take him away before 
the id id com the id com that is the ad com sahib comes on the scene he ordered mohan hurriedly put munnu across his shoulders and saying to his colleagues it is downhill coming down coming back to the bungalow you won't need us he bore the boy home mrs main waring was quite concerned when she came out of the dance hall with major merchant and learned that the boy had to be taken home because he spat blood her efforts at social climbing had not been very successful because she had been herded aside with the indian crowd and only one english cavalry officer had danced with her she had thought of bringing the major home and forgetting all about the ball over a bottle of brandy and the supper which she had ordered but now she felt wretched and then when the uh, major examined munnu and pronounced very unfavorably on his condition she cried according to the orders of the health officer munnu was removed the next day to a segregated three roomed hut on the slopes of chota simla where there were two other coolies suffering from consumption mohan came to look after him La, uh, end of page number 280 now page number 281 he was enjoined absolutely qu- absolute quiet and after a brief spell of coughing and another hemorrhage he felt well the only trouble was that he could not walk or stand up or exert himself in the least so he lay on the veranda of the hut on a low bedstead covered by a thick quilt all day Mrs Main Warden came down to see him with gifts of fruit and flowers during the first few days and even nursed him with a complacent hypocrisy bowing up the deject- dejected spirit of the boy with sentiments like you will get well you have no disease you are just run down she was really being kind as to a point that she did suffer qualms of conscience about having ill used the poor dear but she was not allowed to be kind and good the major forbade her from going down to the hut on pain of having on pain of having to segregate her too if she persisted in her intercourse with the servant and she had to efface herself completely and suffer in silence munnu had borne a resentment against her during the later stages of their uh, friendship with major merchant and when he had begun to bleed and the knowledge of death confronted him he had hated her for a while but now that he was actually sick in bed vaguely torn between the fear of dying and the hope of living something happened to him he felt docile and good and kind towards her and everyone else it was as if the nerves of his body in their gradual weakening had begun to accept the humiliation which in the uh, which in the pride of their functioning they had never acknowledged <coughs> he stood uh, he looked strangely tender now his face sunken and pale his eyes bulging out of their deep dark sockets weakly exploring the hollows of the hills his uh, uh, body feeling the sand run through the hourglass uh, uh, glass of time when a hemorrhage occurred he looked terribly frightened but when the sun shone and his breathing was a little better he became intent and absorbed in himself he wanted to get well and when he uh, when he not only uh, and when he not only enjoyed regular breathing but had enough uh, had no cough he wanted to get a little better and he made plans in his head ratan had written to him to come to bombay to a small job in the pay of the trade union organizing the fight against the pathan money lenders the foreman and the factory wallas munnu felt he would go and since the spell of the warm weather lasted and the flies and the mosquitoes were not too not too troublesome he began to feel stronger every day and looked forward to testing his powers for the journey to bombay by a long walk end of page number 281 now page 2 uh, 282 another attack of hemorrhage however and there seemed no prospect of getting out of bed and he was tortured by doubts and fears any slightest cough after this made him feel ho- hopeless and now he struggled not to get worse the trouble continued though somewhat abated an hour of sunshine seemed a blessing the doctor's a doctor's look on his weekly visit 
was not reassuring. However, he could not. He could feel it behind the mask of authority that Major Merchant wore on his face. Nothing seemed to exist there for outside himself, apart from the memories of his wanderings. Mohan was a consolation because he came and sat on his bed and pressed his head in the evening. But it rained and the clouds hovered menacingly over the adjacent hills. Then the depression lifted. Then he, uh, then he lay, and he lay watching the tires of blue sage and barley on the slopes of the valley before him. He felt the drift of the wind and watched the unfolding of snapshots of his memory, disconnected and strange, as in a dream. The soft blatherings, b l e t h e r i n g s, blatherings of the afternoon air. Would develop into a storm. The congestion of his on his chest seemed to become acute. The trouble was again eased. However, a few whole days of good health. After all, I am not going to die. He said to himself, a downpour, and he began to doubt if he would ever get well. He felt exhausted and lay weary and apathetic, looking at Mohan, frank-eyed and helpless. Clinging to him as if the mere touch of him, of his、uh, friend's body, would give him life. All right, Munnu brother, you are a brave lad. Mohan assured him. Munnu clutched at the Mohan at Mohan's、uh, hand and felt the warm blood in his veins, like a tide、uh, reach out to distances to which it had never gone before. But in the early hours of one unreal, one、uh, white night, he passed away. The tide of his life having reached back to the depths, to the de- deeps. End of the book. End of the book. Page number two eighty two. End of the book. The coolie by Mulk Raj Anand.